and for all of the schools in the social sciences. Um, and as, just as, like Dermot, I do a lot of supporting of systematic reviews, people doing systematic reviews for their PhDs and for other things, but so, for the social sciences. So this session is being recorded. Uh, I've just hit the record button, so I missed my introduction of myself, but that's okay. not a big deal. Um, we will be alternating uh, this presentation as we go through it. So one of us will be monitoring the chat uh, at, at all times. So if you have a question, please pop it into the chat box. Uh, we also hope to, um, we, we, we will be hanging around for a few minutes afterwards. So if there's a more detailed question you want an answer to, we'll be happy to try and answer it at that stage. Uh, so uh, do we want to... Hit the get started then, Martha. Let's, let's get started. Terrific. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, where are we? There. And I'm going to present. Dear Mut, can you see the full screen there? I can, yeah. Excellent. Okay, so. Let's get started. So there's a caveat to, to the session for today. Um, we are going to be sh um, sharing the presentation later with all of you. And um, these are the things that you should be learning in this session. So understanding the structure of a systematic review, knowing how to formulate a search strategy, and being aware of other sources of information than the ones that you normally would think of using. But there will be also slides on how to manage your results and how to locate the full text of articles that you want to read. We may not get to those aspects today because we are very tight for time, but we're putting that information in there so you have access to it. Okay, so. Before we start, I want you to think about where you think you can find information for a systematic review. And then I'm going to ask you to go to menti.com on your computer. So menti.com. And when you get there, enter this code 902008814. And then enter three possible information sources that you would think about when trying to find information for your systematic review. So menti.com 902008814. Okay, and now I'm going to do a news share. Uh, and actually, first of all, I have to, Whoop. whoops, okay, Keep let back. me, yeah, <clears throat> so let me go back to this, and let me show you what's coming up in that Google, uh, in that word cloud that we are creating. So these are the places that you think you would look for information for your systematic review. And all of the usual suspects are appearing there. So PubMed, OneSearch, Scopus, uh, library website, Prospero, Web of Science. Now remember, I haven't asked you what your research is about. I've asked you where you would find information for your systematic review, okay? So PubMed, very big there. Google Scholar, very big there. Uh, the databases, Mendeley, interesting. Sinal, JSTOR, Embase. So many of you are very familiar with the databases that the library can uh, help you access. 
and also with databases that are available openly like PubMed and the Cochrane Library and all of those. Now Prisma is a different thing, um, so we'll, we'll be talking about Prisma later on. Okay, so 12 of you have participated in this. Uh, I don't think there's anybody else putting in information. So I'm going to go back to my presentation. Uh, but actually, first I have to escape this. Stop sharing for a minute and share the screen. Uh, okay. Now. So there's one thing that none of you have mentioned, um, which is very important. And it's grey literature resources. So you can find information for your systematic review uh, in journals, in databases, but also grey literature. You can also do what's called snowballing, which is looking at the references in a journal article and then checking those to see what they are referencing and then checking those and you're building up your number of articles to review by doing this. You can also talk to an expert, particularly if it is the case that you are updating a systematic review that has been done before by someone else, that someone else will be able to point you in the direction of relevant articles. And then finally, you can also do manual searching. And this usually applies when you know that a particular journal title is really relevant to your research, but maybe we don't subscribe to it at UCD library. So you can still access the journal website and check individual journal issues for titles that might be relevant. Okay, so. What is a systematic review? As its name says, the important thing about a systematic review is that it is systematic. So that it has a clearly stated set of objectives with predefined eligibility criteria for studies, that it has a reproducible methodology and a systematic search so you don't search random keywords, you find a structured systematic way of looking for keywords. Um, and then that you assess the validity of the studies, including the risk of bias. And some of you may be using specific measures to do this that have already been developed. And then that you do a systematic presentation and synthesis of the characteristics and findings of the included studies. So, there are many different types of review. A full systematic review can take years and it involves a team of people. In some areas of um, research, like for instance, public policy, you may be asked uh, by a government agency or by an NGO to carry out a review of the literature that has to happen in a very limited amount of time. And if that's the case, you may opt for a rapid review where you may be limiting the number of results by a specific framework of, of time or doing things that will allow you to do quite a systematic review, but in a quicker way. So before you start thinking about your review, think about your research topic, think about uh, your resources and your time frame, and that will help you choose 
which of these types of review you need to go for. Okay. So just to go a little bit deeper into the difference between a systematic review and an ordinary literature review. With a systematic review, you're focused on a single question usually, whereas with a literature review, uh, you may not have a specific question. Importantly, you should have a protocol for your systematic review. And a protocol is basically a plan for how you're going to conduct your review. And you register your protocol, it is peer reviewed, and it's out there to let other people know that you are carrying out a review on this particular topic and what are going to be the methods of your review. And then, as I was saying earlier, you're, you provide a background for your review, but you have really clear objectives and you have specific criteria for including studies or for excluding them. And we'll explore those in a minute. And then you have a comprehensive search conducted in a systematic way. Whereas in an ordinary literature review, you may not explicitly state your strategy when you're publishing your review. Other aspects that you need to consider. You have a comprehensive evaluation of the study quality. And very importantly, when you're selecting your articles, there is at least double screening, but sometimes it's even better to have three people screening the articles to be included. Uh, and then you have clear summaries of the studies. You take into account the quality of the evidence supplied in those studies and you minimize publication and selection bias so that the review can easily be reproduced. Okay, but, and this is something that you really have to take into account. It has to be a team. If you're on your own, you're not conducting a systematic review. You may be conducting a literature review in a systematic way, but it isn't a systematic review because if there's only one person screening the articles, it's virtually impossible to exclude selection bias because you're going to have a bias for what you want to include and what you want to exclude. And in order to counteract that, you need to have at least a second screener, if not a third one or even a fourth one. Okay? So, somebody mentioned Prisma in the sources of information for your systematic review. And Prisma is not exactly a source of information, but it is a really important list of items that you should include in the structure of your systematic review. So it helps you report systematic reviews on a very wide array of topics in a way that is transparent and it's complete and it's systematic. And it is comprised of a checklist and a flowchart. And those two are links. So when we share the presentation, you will be able to click on those links and see the checklist and the flowchart. One thing that certainly both Dermot and myself, but I know that other librarians have noticed that sometimes when people register the protocols for a systematic review on, or even when they register their systematic reviews themselves, they tend to do a very bad job of reporting how exactly they have searched their reviews. Sometimes they don't report the actual search strategy with all of the keywords. Sometimes they don't include the filters that they have applied. Sometimes there are always things that are missing. So Prisma in January 2021 published an extension to the Prisma statement 
with a checklist of 16 items that should be included when you're reporting your search. And they come, you know, some of the, those items are really easy to think about, like the names of the databases that you search and the exact search strategy that you use for each database. And others may not be so obvious. So again, those are links that you can click on and you'll be able to check the checklist, uh, read the article on the preparation of this Prisma extension. Now, there are two major uh, systematic review bodies one is the Campbell Collaboration, which specializes in systematic reviews for more social science aspects like education and crime and things like that. And those are links to the specific expectations that a Campbell Collaboration review uh, has for people who are registering their, registering their reviews with them. So if you're thinking about doing a review in a social science re related topic and you want to register it with the Campbell collaboration, check these standards. Because if you don't follow those standards, it won't be approved for registration with Campbell. And then for health related reviews uh, and for science in general, uh, the Cochrane Library, the, the Cochrane system is really important. And again, they have specific standards for intervention reviews that are listed in that link. Okay, so these are the main steps in a systematic review. And very importantly, get your question. Until you have a specific question that is well framed, it's going to be very difficult to go on to the next steps in your review. So get your question, then develop a protocol with inclusion and exclusion criteria, locate the relevant studies, select the relevant studies, assess the quality of those studies, and then extract the data. Analyze, summarize, and synthesize the relevant studies, interpret those results, and then publish them. Let me show you that in a more visually uh, clear flowchart. And this comes from Prisma. So you have your question, you do a really quick scoping search with minimal keywords and that will give you a sense of how much is out there and of the things that you want to include and exclude. And once you have a sense of that, then you can develop your protocol. The protocol will establish exactly what you're going to do and that will allow you to then develop your full search and carry it out do title and abstract screening, full text retrieval, full text screening. Sometimes from the full text screening, you will have come up with new keywords that might be relevant and you can do additional searching. You agree on the included references and data extraction. And Sometimes you may have to redo your, your search your, or update it because there may have been quite a stretch of time between the initial search and where you are now. And then you finally write up. The areas surrounded with the red circles are the areas where a librarian can help you. So we can help you with your scoping search we can help you with your full search. We can help you retrieve the full text of articles that you're looking for. We can help you develop additional searching. And all throughout, we can help you with the references management because a really important part of carrying out a systematic review is managing your references effectively.
Okay. So, how do you get your protocol? This is what a protocol does. It describes the rationale or the research question and the planned methods of the review. You should register them if possible in a registry such as Prospero and you should definitely develop your protocol a priori before you carry out your full systematic review. These are some of the inclusion and exclusion criteria that you may want to develop as part of your protocol. So you may exclude or include criteria according to the type of study. Like for instance, you may decide that you only want randomized controlled trials included in your selected types of studies or types of participants. If you are focusing on a specific population, defining their age, their gender or condition will allow you to say any articles that are not focused on this specific population will not be included in my review. Or you may want to exclude or include uh, uh, studies on the basis of the specific interventions that you're investigating. You may also want to consider whether to include interventions that, are, that have been carried out all over the world or just in Ireland. Very often, just focusing on the studies done in Ireland will not be sufficient for a systematic review. So that's a, a, something you need to consider. Or you may also want to include types of outcome measures. So are you looking at studies that include, say, changes in social project, uh, uh, progress indicators or changes in educational outcomes or changes in quality of life or in life expectancy, etc. So once you start, once you have done a scoping search and you start looking at the set of results and you start saying to yourself, oh no, that article doesn't uh, focus on what I want to include, then that will allow you to develop your set of inclusion and exclusion criteria and that will then allow you to develop a full-blown protocol for your review. And the first thing to do about starting a systematic review, the first really important step is has it already been done? Or is there somebody else out there who's actually looking at the same thing? And this is why re registering your protocol in a registry like Prospero is really important because it allows you to kind of stake your territory and say, I am doing this review. So, if you Search for studies. This will allow you to cover three main purposes. Verify that your question hasn't already been answered. Verify that there are no other review protocols registered with researchers who are already looking at the same questions but may not have published the review yet. But also it lets you identify systematic reviews that may be on a related topic but not exactly on your topic because these will uh, provide you with information about things like the databases that they used for their searches or specific keywords that they use or even relevant primary studies that you may want to include in your own reviews. Okay, so where do you look for systematic reviews? You look for them in places like the Cochrane Collaboration or the Campbell Library or Prospero, which is the uh, registry of systematic review protocols, or some databases will allow you to filter results by type of publication. 
So for instance, PubMed is an example of one of those for health and PsycInfo is another such database for the social sciences. So once you have your systematic review quest research question, you can then try and see if any other systematic reviews on this topic have been carried out. Which leads me to selecting your sources. Where are you going to search the literature? You're going to use databases, but you're also going to use grey literature. And you're also going to do hand searching, as I mentioned before. So those are some of the databases that UCD Library can offer you access to. They are subscription databases, so they are extremely expensive and you will not have access to most of them except for PubMed when you leave UCD. So make the most of them now. But for some specific research topics, there will be literature that has been put together which hasn't gone through the ordinary academic publishing cycle but that is still really relevant. And I'm talking about things like government white papers, reports by expert groups, um, for instance, conference proceedings or uh, dissertations, unpublished dissertations. So all of those can be really important. And if you leave them up, out, you may be missing some absolutely key information. There are some databases that, that gather some of that type of literature, like Open Gray or Base, but most of the times what you need to do is identify the websites of the relevant organizations for your topic and then go to them and search their publications sections or browse them. And then you do, you also need to include manual searches, as I said, for journals that are not contained in the databases that we subscribe to. Okay, so let's go for exercise one, which I'm hoping you will all be able to do. And I think Diarmuid will be able to put in a, a link to the links to Cochrane, Campbell, and Prospero. They're already there, Martha, Excellent. in the chat box. So decide which one is more relevant to you. If you're doing something to do with health or science, Cochrane will probably be more relevant. If you're doing something to do with social science, then the Campbell Library will be more relevant. Use very broad keywords and see what you come up with. We're going to give you five minutes. So it's now 10.30 and we're going to give you until 10.35 to do this. And I'm going to stop sharing for a minute. And as you do your searches, can you please let us know whether you're finding relevant systematic reviews on your topics or whether you're not finding anything. Uh, and don't forget also, you can all, if you've got a question, you can put it into the chat box as well and we will try and answer it through there as well. Absolutely. So let us know which library you're using and what results you got. And as I say, it doesn't have to be a very complex set of keywords, just two or three that relate to your topic.
Wow, Hatim, 6,316 results. And uh, that's probably one of those cases where you need to refine your search to come up with something more focused. And um, Alicia, you were searching for tumors with uh, uh, an asterisk at the end of it as a wild card. If you get rid of that, you should find 409 in the Cochrane Library. Oh, okay. Um, also, I just point out the Cochrane seems to be a bit flaky at the moment. I got an error message a few seconds ago when I was just doing it, but it seems to have sorted itself out. Okay. Okay, I'm realizing that the link we gave you for Campbell um, is actually a link to the entire Wiley Online Library. So what you need to do is, at the bottom where it says published in, put in Campbell Systematic Reviews. Let me just uh, share my screen for a second and you'll be able to see what I mean. So see the way it says published in, put in Campbell systematic reviews and then you do your search for food security hat team and that might give you something a little bit more focused. And okay. Okay, Anya, so what you're supposed to do is take, uh, find out if there are any systematic reviews being done on your topic. So if your topic is on this, something to do with social sciences, click on the link to the Campbell Library. And if your topic is something to do with health or science, click on the Cochrane Library. One, if you're finding that you're not getting any reference, any results, it might be that your term, term is too specific and you might want to think of a broader term when searching. And remember, this is you, you will find that this is an iterative process. You will get so far and then you will find more information and your search will develop. It's not something that is settled in 15 minutes or half an hour. Developing your search takes time and it takes effort. And once again, because this is a team, involve the team in doing this um, to make sure that you're not missing something that um, that may be become obvious when a, when a fresh pair of eyes uh, comes onto it. So we, we continue on, Martha? Yeah, let's do that. Do you want to go on? Yep, yeah, perfect. Yeah. Thank you. So you can try all this yourselves after the session. This is all part of the, of the process. So we are going to, I'm going to carry on and talk a bit more about uh, developing your, your search strategy. Okay. No, wrong one. Sorry, excuse me. Where's my browser gone? There we, there we go. Okay. Okay, so at this stage, we've talked about your uh, developing your um, protocol. And as part of your protocol, as Martha said, you will be developing or, or demonstrating uh, an example of a search that you're going to develop. Uh, and to help you develop your search, there are a couple of tools that you can use. Some of you may know some of them already uh, from previous uh, research that you've done, but they give you a structure for looking at your question. So when you're starting off, as Martha said, you need to have a well-defined question. The question should uh, review, should specify the type of population, who are the, who are the participants, any type of interventions and comparisons if, if, if possible, and also the type of outcomes that are of interest. Uh, 
And as I said, there are a number of acronyms that you can use to help you with that. Um, and systematic reviews started in initially in, in the health field and have spread out beyond to social sciences and other areas as well. And PICO is probably the one that is most uh, popular or, or most well known. Uh, and PICO stands for Patient Intervention Comparison and Outcome. So when you look at your research question, what are the characteristics of the patient or, or, or population? Or what is the condition or disease you're interested in, i.e. Um, cancer patients? What's the intervention or exposure? What do you want to do with this patient? Do you want to treat them, diagnose or observe? So do you want to do chemotherapy? Uh, what's the alternative to the intervention? Is it radiotherapy? And then what is the outcome? Uh, is it death, complications, quality of life, etc.? There are other alternatives to PICO. PEO, for example, is used for reviewing qualitative research. And the P this time stands for the population and the problem. This is the condition, uh, social economic status, the age, gender, ethnicity, exposure. Uh, so this would be risk factors, protective factors, uh, program intervention uh, or service. Outcome or themes, experiences, attitudes, feelings, changes of, uh, of, uh, of living conditions, education education outcomes, social mobility, etc. SPIDER is also used for qualitative evidence synthesis. And the S stands for sample. PI is the phenomenon of interest, reasons for the behavior. Uh, and uh, the D is for design, the data collection method used. Is it an interview or focus group? E is for evaluation. So outcome measures, educational outcomes, et cetera. And the R is research type, qualitative, quantitative, mixed methods. SPICE is for qualitative evidence synthesis. S is for setting, where, in what context. P is perspective for whom. The I is intervention or the phenomenon of interest. C is comparison, what else are you comparing it to? E is for evaluation, how well, what result. Um, so PICO is, is the most uh, commonly used one in health, but it's really important that you do pick the most relevant and appropriate one for the question uh, that, you're, that you're trying to answer. And this will allow you then to build up an effective search strategy. It gives you a structure to start thinking of alternative keywords that you can use when searching for the, on this topic. So once you've got your PICO started, you start building up your search strategy. So use a thesaurus um, to help you think of alternative terms uh, as, as many keywords as possible. You can always take out ones that you later on decide are not appropriate, but I would say just, just throw everything down uh, uh, at the start. As Martha says, you should have hopefully located some existing uh, systematic reviews. And don't worry if it's not the totality of your, of your topic. If you can find one that deals with one of your PICO elements, you can see what, what keywords that they used for that and adapt them for your own use. Check and see if you can find any articles on your topic. You may have discovered these in your scoping review uh, and that the articles that are really that you think are really, really relevant. So search for those in the databases you plan on using and see what keywords the databases assign to them as well. Uh, because if you can find the articles you like with those keywords, you're probably going to find similar and related articles as well. And this can help throw up more keywords that you weren't aware of. And these are some of the things you can think about when you are thinking about your keywords. What alternative vocabulary is being used when people are talking about your topic? Just because you're comfortable using a certain uh, certain keywords doesn't mean that those are the only keywords that people are using. Remember, in a systematic review, you're trying to find all the literature. So you're interested in what people are writing in other parts of the world, and they may have other cultural or professional reasons for giving it a slightly different name. 
one of the big things you also have to be aware of and take and take into consideration is how people spell the same word. So this could be American and Irish spelling of words, but it could also be medical uh, English as well. So words like color can be spelled slightly differently or pediatric can also spell slightly differently depending on your context. And while the databases are very, very powerful, they're also very literal. So if you tell the database to ser search for color with a U, there's no guarantee that it's going to it's going to think to search for color without you. You have to explicitly tell the database to do that. You could also find yourself searching for loads of similar words that have the same root but different endings. You can very easily tell the database to search from a common root. Uh, the example here we have on the screen is child with an asterisk, and the asterisk represents all the potential endings. So you can tell the database to search for all potential endings without you having to type them all in. You might be searching for abbreviations. Uh, so if you're searching for abbreviations, you search for the full version as well. So if you're searching for University College Dublin, you might also search for UCD. If there's specific examples or cases, make sure you put them in. Um, are there more general terms or broader terms? So if you're finding nothing, with the specific terms that you're coming in, it could be because they're too specific and you might want to get a broader term. And you also need to be aware of there are certain categories that you want to exclude and uh, put those into your search strategy as well to get rid of them. So all the information that you've gathered from your scoping search, from reading existing systematic reviews and articles that have been published will help you develop your search strategy. Decide whether you're going to use Pico, Peel, Spider, etc., to start developing your keywords. It's best to avoid having too many concepts, but to have as many keywords as is necessary to search uh, each, each concept thoroughly. So don't be put off or don't be put out and think, oh, I've got too many keywords for these for this concept. If you think they're all relevant then that's fine. And where another, where another way in that uh, your search strategy for a systematic review differs from that of a ordinary literature review is that you won't be just using keywords. So as well as using your keywords or free text words, you'll also be using to source or subject terms. So those of you who've used PubMed will be using MeSH, um, CINAHL uses CINAHL headings and health, uh, PsycInfo has a thesaurus, and um, a lot of the academic databases will have a thesaurus. And you'll need to map your keywords to the thesaurus um, as you go from database to database. And you may find as you go from database to database, because they are focused on doing different things, they may throw up new keywords that you're not familiar with. So any new keywords, you have to integrate them back into your search strategy as well. So we're going to do a bit of an example. So we've got a very simple research question here. And the question we're asking, is chemotherapy more efficient than surgery in managing stage one breast cancer for women patients? So I applied, I applied PICO to this. My population is breast cancer. My intervention is chemotherapy. The comparison in this case is surgery and our outcome is reduced mortality. So if this was a systematic review that I was doing, my next step would be to think of all the possible ways of describing each of those uh, PICO elements. So alternative terms for breast cancer, alternative terms for chemotherapy, surgery, mortality, etc. So this is where we're going to throw it up to you. We're going to give you uh, just for a few minutes. So if you want to, I'm going to stop sharing. And if you want to put into the chat box any possible terms that you might initially for breast cancer. Anything at all? Or speak up if you have a keyword that you might think would be useful. Okay, uh, breast cancer, breast tumor. Neoplasm, fantastic. Uh, ductal carcinoma in situ, fantastic growth. That's great. 
And our second term is chemotherapy. Can anybody think of any other term for chemotherapy? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I can, I can hear somebody very faintly, but I, I can't hear them fully. Drug treatment, it's terrific. We've got mammary cancer as well for breast cancer. Okay, radiation. That's fantastic. And can anybody think of any other term for uh, surgery? which I think is our third concept. Operation, thank you. Resection, great. Mastectomy, terrific. Lumpectomy, terrific. And the last one then is, uh, is what is is reduced mortality as our as our last concept? Can anybody think of any other possible term for reduced mortality? Uh, thanks, death, survival rate, survival time, reduced overall survival. You mark survivorship. Thank you. Reduced recurrence free survival, uh, progression, free survival. We're getting so many terms here, it's fantastic. And this is what's the great thing about having the team. Uh, an individual might have run out of inspiration a long time ago, uh, but the, uh, the, the hive mind always comes true. Fantastic, so I didn't get anywhere near as, as, as near the, uh, all those terms. Uh, let me just, okay, so this is with the additional one. So I came up with breast neoplasms, breast tumors, and don't forget breast tumors can be spelled slightly differently. So you need to allow for that. Chemotherapy, drug therapy, drug treatment, surgery, uh, operation, lumpectomy, mastectomy, reduced mortality, mortality rate. And now we're starting to build up our search strategy. So this is how I start building up my search strategy. So whatever uh, structure that you're using, whether it's PICO, PCC, PO, et cetera, start using that as the structure for building up your search. And this is my first draft of my search strategy. I've laid out, in a, I would have laid this out in a Word document. So I've got breast cancer under P or patient, uh, breast neoplasms or breast tumors, chemotherapy under intervention or drug therapy, uh, and C, surgery or operation. And my outcome was reduced mortality or mortality rate. And I would have put in all those extra ones that people have come up with as well. Um, uh, but obviously, we don't have time to do it here uh, at, at the moment. Okay, so once you've got your search strategy, your, 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 your structure, you need to start thinking about your search strategy. How are you going to bundle these together so that you can run your search as effectively and as thoroughly as possible? And it's really important that you document everything. So there, when you go into the Prisma, um, check, uh, the Prisma checklist, you'll see there is a load of information that they're expecting you to to report on. So document everything. The decisions you make as a team, make sure that they're recorded. So that you're not wondering why this is happening and not this. Understand the logic of what you've done. Keep track using a research diary. And this is just somewhere that you can keep track of what you've searched and how you've searched, uh, what you've managed to read and what you can't get. Uh, and this is just an example of, of a research diary. So I, on the left-hand column, I've laid out my search strategy so I know what's worked. I said what database I've gone into, if I've applied any limits when I've searched, my number of result, hits, articles I re I've reviewed, and any articles that you have difficulty getting. So document your search strategy. 
as Martha said at the very start, a search your search strategy or is not something that is created on the fly. It ha you write it out before you run it. So if you get a spurt of inspiration, you think it's brilliant, don't just go straight out to the database, put it into whatever document you've written out your search strategy in and then run it. Just don't, because uh, it's very easy to get distracted and then forget that bolt of inspiration uh, uh, and, and you don't have it uh, going forward. So these are the tools that you can use to fine tune and develop your search strategy. And you may be aware of a number of these already. The most basic one or the most fundamental tool in developing your search is Boolean operators. And there are three of them. There is and, or, or not. And you can use these to broaden your search, narrow your search, or exclude terms from your search. So when you're searching for a or oh, everything within us within one of your Pico elements, you'll use the or operator. And you'll have if you if we if we go back a second to uh, my first draft, you can see I put my or operator there between all my keywords. So breast cancer or breast neoplasms or breast tumors. So I don't care as long as one of those terms turns up in an article. So I'm being really, really broad and really thorough. When I'm combining my Pico elements, I can use the and operator, autism and child. And that will give you the little bit in the center there where those circles overlap. So it's being allowing you to narrow down your search and focus in. And the last one is the not operator. Not allows you to exclude terms. So autism, not Asperger syndrome. That will um, return any articles dealing with Asperger syndrome. Sorry, it will bring back any articles dealing with autism, but exclude anything to do with Asperger syndrome. Even the little bit in the center there where they both overlap is going to be excluded because you said you don't want to see anything to do with um, Asperger syndrome. And just to say, this is the most basic fundamental building block. And if you get this right, uh, you're well on your way. Phrase searching is important. You need to tell the databases when you're searching for a phrase. And a phrase is two or more words that you want to appear together in a particular order. So at academic achievement or school-based, uh, those are phrases. If you didn't put the, quest, the quotation marks around them, there is the possibility that database will do an and search. So academic and achievement, which is not as precise as academic achievement as a phrase. So being more precise allows you to narrow your search. Because remember, at the end of the day, you will have to screen all your results. So the more focused you are, the less articles you will have to, to screen. Another tool similar to phrase searching is proximity searching. And in this, you are more concerned with how close words are together rather than having them together in a particular order. So the example we have here is academic adjacent three achievement. That will bring back any references where academic and achievement occur within three words of each other. But you don't care which comes first. Uh, this will become more effective as you become more familiar with the literature and you recognize the, the relationships of the word. Now, different databases may call it different terms. Some databases will say adjacent, some will say within or near. So go into the database to check what exactly you will have to do. So, and it's worth pointing out that you will have to adjust your search as you go from database to database to uh, compensate for things like adjacent uh, and uh, the other things which we'll be carrying, uh, which we will be re referring to in a minute. So you can't just copy your search from one database to the other. There is fine tuning as you go from one to the other. Truncation allows you to search for all possible endings of a word that have a common root or stem. So the example here we have is educate with 
the uh, asterisk after the T, and that will get you educate, educates, educates, educated, education, educational, educationally. And it'll just keep going on and on and on on this run out of all endings. But you have just to concern yourself with getting the first bit of it right. The database will automatically get all possible endings. You do need to also, as I said earlier on, look out for alternative spellings of the same word. Color or color, center or center, pediatric or pediatric. Remember the database is not necessarily going to search for the version you haven't typed in. So you can take out the letter that differs. The example we have here is color with the question mark where the U should be, as we spell it. And that will search for color with the U and color without a U. Now, once again, this is one of the, of the things that you will have to check as you go from database to database. Not all databases will use a question mark when they're looking for alternative spellings. Not all databases will use the asterisks when they're using truncation. So go to the help pages of the databases and they'll tell you exactly what symbol you should be using and how to use it. You can also use the, the fact that the databases have highly structured records. And uh, one of the most invaluable in this from a systematic view point of view is limiting your search results to title and abstract. You may find that when you're just searching with keywords everywhere, you're finding loads of what uh, are irrelevant articles. So you can try and ramp up the, um, the relevance by recognizing which words you need, you need to appear in the title or abstract of your results, and then telling the database to search for those. So there's drop down menus that you can use to, to signify that when you're building up your search. Uh, uh, to, to, to once again, raise the relevance of what you find and also reduce the numbers that, that come back as well. Because once again, you will have to screen everything that you get in your search results. So this is where we get so far. I've now, based upon what we've covered, I have adapted my search. I have put my um, truncation searching for breast cancer or breast cancer or breast cancers, breast neoplasm or neoplasms, breast tumor or breast tumors, uh, drug therapy or drug therapies, operation or operations, etc. I've also identified the phrases and I put more quotation marks around it. So all the time you should be updating your search because this, what we have on the screen is going to be the search that you are going to actually run um, in the database. So by doing it this way, when you have finished this process, it'll just be a matter of copying and pasting your search into the database. It's adapted already for, this, for the database that you want to do. And one of the biggest differences that might be facing you is the, the fact that as well as using keywords, you have to use thesaurus terms when you're searching for a systematic review. Uh, it, it's a belt and braces approach. Both have their weaknesses. Uh, a title, if you're searching for a keyword, you may not have all the keywords uh, or you may not be aware of all the keywords and therefore your search might not be complete. If you use the thesaurus, um, that overcompensate, that helps you compensate for that because the people behind the database have recognized there are multiple keywords uh, for the same concept. And when you're talking about the SORA searching, not all the references, particularly if they're newer references in the database, may be fully uh, edited and may uh, not have the um, may not have the thesaurus term assigned to it. So they'll help compensate for each other. And also they help compensate against human error where the, the author might have put in a spelling mistake and hasn't been caught by the editorial staff of the journal or the person behind the uh, thesaurus has made a mistake. So you're just trying to make sure that you're being as thorough as possible. So the idea behind the thesaurus is to help you overcome the fact that people around the world might be using multiple terms for the same concept, but you might not be aware of them, but the people behind the database are checking 
the uh, research on a daily basis. And they will decide if people are using four terms for the same concept, which is their preferred term in, th in their thesaurus, and then you can add it. The thesaurus term will change from database to database. So this is another thing you will need to adjust as you go from database to database. However, your keywords will remain constant from database to database. Most databases, I think uh, Martha would agree with me, these days will have a thesaurus, but there are some databases like Web of Science, for example, that doesn't have a thesaurus. So if you haven't used a thesaurus, we're just going to quickly show you what one of the thesauruses looked like or thesauri looked like. And we're going to quickly show you PubMed. So I'm going to stop sharing here. And I will uh, share again. Um, and we go out to PubMed. Oops, go away. Uh, okay, so if we go to PubMed, and PubMed is a health related databases. So obviously if you're not doing health, you'll go out to your own databases, PsycInfo, etc. They have their own thesaurus. And in many cases, you'll find the thesaurus in the advanced search part of the database. Here in PubMed, you'll find the, the mesh database here under the section called Explore. Just click on that. And we were going to search for breast cancer. and you just click on search, you will get a number of results depending on the keyword, the, the term that you put in. Uh, generally, it's ranked with the relevant one at the top and you decide which is closest. And in this instance, breast neoplasms is the approved term. So you can click on the link there to see more information about what's happening. So if you scroll on down, the entry terms is a really helpful place because these are the alternative terms that are being that are people might be using around the world to describe the same concept. So th this is really good in that it might suggest new keywords that you haven't got already in your search strategy. So you can just copy those. Ignore the ones that are written like this, tumor, comma, breast, because nobody will actually be writing like that. So you can just safely ignore those. And if you scroll on down, you'll see what's called the mesh hierarchy. All the thesauri will have a hierarchy, broader or narrower terms. And so breast neoplasms is the term, it's in bold and black, and underneath it and indented to the right are the narrower terms. Now, you do have the choice of exploding or not exploding, and exploding just means whether or not you want to include the terms that are narrower underneath it. So this is where your own intellectual choice will come in. Just a slight note of, uh, of caution about PubMed. PubMed is the only database I've come across where it automatically includes the narrower terms. In other databases, there's a button you've got to tick to include them. So if you don't want the narrower terms in PubMed, you just scroll back up and click on do not include mesh terms found below this term of the hierarchy. And there's another button as well, restrict to mesh major topic. And this relates to how much content on this article that you want to, on this topic you want to see. Any little mention, leave it alone. But if you think no breast tumor has to be a major part of every article that's returned, you can take the box. So you make your choices. And then at the very top, that term, uh, uh, whoops, that's a previous one. You need to click on the add to search builder. And then you can copy that and add that to your search strategy that you've built up already. And you need to do that for each keyword that you've discovered in your, that in your search strategy one at a time. So if you had other terms for breast, new, breast cancer, you check all of those. Uh, if you've got uh, for chemotherapy, all the terms for chemotherapy. My advice would be do each one at a time so that you don't mix them up and keep everything within the proper PICO element. So if I go back to the presentation and I share again, this is now the search that I've developed. 
So I have now added my mesh terms at the end of each of my search strategies. And then I can just copy each of, the, each of those uh, search uh, strings into my database. Another bit of advice I think I, I should pass on is that when you're running your search, do each of those search strategies or search strings one at a time. So do your patient search strategy first, do your uh, intervention, you do your comparison and do your outcome. Don't look at the results because you're not interested because they all represent, in this case, one quarter of your topic. You can use the search history in the database to combine them and that's when you're interested uh, because that's where all your search strings come together. So I'm going to stop sharing and this is where some people usually come together, come with some questions, um, particularly about uh, the thesaurus. So does anybody have any questions about that? I have a question. Yes. Sorry, I was going to type it, but my typing skill, my typing <laughs> skills are, I'd be forever here. Um, so just to clarify for the PICO, because that was one of my questions that I came here today with. So actually you've kind of answered it. Um, so for the PICO, so for population, I'm going to run that search um, engine off first. So I'm going to use all those terms we've come up with and I'm going to run that and say I get 50 results. No, you okay. don't look at anything. So don't you look do, at it. You do your population first of all. And mm -hmm. don't be freaked out if you, if because uh, we sometimes uh, have a bit of a gasp and we end up with five or six million references. Don't worry about that. So do okay. do your your population first as one search string. <clears throat> okay. Then do your next one, your intervention, your comparison, and your outcome. All of the databases will have a search history. And you, then you just combine your searches at that stage. How do you combine them? So basically... Okay, I'll show the easiest thing is I'll just quickly show you. I'll do a very simple search. Amazing. Just quickly Thank show you. you. Thank you. Anything you want to add, Martha, at that stage? No, exactly the same as you say. Uh, don't worry if you get millions of results for one of your PICO or SPICE or PEO elements. Because once you combine them all then you will get much reduced numbers. So I've gone back to PubMed and it's just, I'm, I'm literally just going to do a very, very basic, basic search. Uh, so the first search is going to be um, breast cancer. And you can imagine that we've put the full search uh, string in there with breast neoplasms and the mesh terms as well. And I've got nearly half a million references. Um, the next one is uh, chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. And once again, not looking at any of the results, I don't care. So we have 3.4 million references. The next is surgery. And another nearly 5 million. And then it is, um, what's, what's the last one? It is life expectancy. And we have 43,000. Always, I'm always cautious when numbers are low because it gives you a limited amount of overlap. And you see under the advanced and under the search box is an advanced link. Just click it there. And there is our search history in PubMed. So I want to combine breast cancer. So clicking those three little dots, add query. I want to add with and remember we're combining not. So we click and, and you can see him popping into the, the query box up above. And with surgery and with life expectancy. And then you click on search. And we get 170 results. So remember, some of those individual ones have big numbers, nearly 5 million. But when you bring them together, they will shrink back down. Thank you so much. That was something that was bugging me for a while as to how I did that. So thank you. Um, no you've problem. explained it really well. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, so Hannah has a question there. If we, if we could leave that to the end, we'll have a look at that for you, Hannah. So do you want to continue on, Martha? Yes, I will. Uh, let me go back. 
Okay, so let me share my screen. Okay, so something that may seem counterintuitive. A lot of the databases have automatic search filters that you can apply. But for a systematic review, if you apply those search filters, sometimes there may be human error in those filters. So there's no absolute guarantee that the filter will bring you everything that is supposed to be there. So to counter that, um, there are groups of librarians that have developed specific filters for specific types of categories. So, for instance, for PubMed, there's already a specific filter for randomized controlled trials. Um, there are several different ones. And many of these kind of handmade filters that are approved for systematic reviews exist uh, in this intertask inter information specialist subgroup search filter. So I would recommend that you have a look at those. Um, I found an article about developing a systematic review filter for PsycInfo in ProQuest. So if any of you are using PsycInfo and doing a systematic review, then that might be of interest to you. Okay, and then let's talk about the other types of literature that you should be including in your systematic reviews. So these are materials produced by organizations outside the traditional academic publishing. So they could be annual reports, technical reports, project reports, research reports. They could be government documents. So for instance, the library of the Oractus has a fantastic um, resource where you can access those working papers, white papers, evaluations, etc. cetera. Um, there could be thesis or dissertations and there could be also conference papers. And there are certain disciplines in which conference papers are the major way of disseminating your research. And I'm thinking, for instance, of computer science. Um, so those must be added if you want to be able to call your review a systematic review, because the systematic review aims to cover every possible source of information on your topic. Um, so, if you look at the, so these are the publication types. These are the types of organizations that you need to think about. So government departments, civil society or non-governmental organizations. There are also academic centers and departments that may be producing reports or research that doesn't go through the ordinary academic publishing system. Uh, and then of course, also private companies and consultants. Here are some of the great literature, great literature specific websites. So for health research published in Ireland, the Linus database is brilliant because it will give you everything that has been published. Um, there are preprints of articles, there are uh, author versions of articles, but also then grey literature reports. And then Open Grey focuses mostly on European uh, grey literature and mostly reports. Uh, grey literature report is more international and base is also more international. But then, as I said, you need to think in terms of what are the government departments and organizations that are probably doing research in the area of my research topic. And then you need to check their websites and you need to look at their publications sections. Now, some of you will, will be using Google to search for grey literature. 
And if you want to add more power to your Google search strategy, then put in your keywords and then do search specific websites such as site colon and then the URL of the site. Or very often these kinds of um, these types of information come in PDF format. So if you do a, a Google search and then say file type colon PDF, it's more likely that you're going to get li uh, gray literature. You can also do a Google advanced search. And for further information on using Google to search, here is a library guide from UCD library that will give you more step by step uh, kind of instructions on how to go about that. But here is something that you really need to be careful about. Unlike a library database, Google doesn't only go on your keyword terms to give you the set of results. It personalizes your search and takes into account any other Google searches that you have done before. So they're not, the search results are not only based on the relevance of each web page, but also on the websites that you have visited before. So the search results will not be ranked the same way for every user. And they'll take into account your geography, they'll take into account your searches, they'll take into account all sorts of other things because their algorithms are not transparent. So here are some things that you can do to turn off the personalization of searches. Delete your browser search history, log out of your Google account, and then go to the My Activity page to remove all Google services. And for further information on how to do this, go to this URL. It's a really step-by-step -step, uh, kind of advice on how to delete your Google search history on a PC so that when you do a Google search for your systematic review question, it doesn't actually include your Google search history. Okay. And then, as I said, hand searching is a manual method of scanning selected journals. And snowballing means using the reference list of a paper to identify additional papers. Now, databases such as Web of Science and Scopus and Google Scholar will allow you to use their built-in tools to track citations for an article. So you can use those. And then finally, some advice. Use a citation managing, management tool to manage your results. Um, UCD supports EndNote. So you can actually go to the IT website and under downloads, find EndNote desktop and download it to your computer. And Jerma here runs clinics on how to use EndNote for your research. We have a really good library um, web page with tutorials and a video of a sec session we did on EndNote that you can check and exercises that you can do to learn how to use EndNote. If you're using any of the other ones like Zotero or Mendeley, UCD doesn't have specific support for that, but some of us have some expertise in those. So for instance, if you're using Zotero, I can answer questions on that. Um, I'm not so familiar with Mendeley, but I, I can give it a, a try. So um, one thing that's really important when you're using um, your citation managers is that if you're removing duplicates, you're careful of how to do it. So author's names, for instance, may be displayed differently as you move from database to database. And you may have the same paper under what looks like two different authors, when in fact it's just the same author, but the name is displayed in a different way. Okay. These are some types of software that are used for systematic review. 
Covidence, Distiller SR and Rayan. Both Covidence and Distiller SR have uh, subscriptions to them. And I know that some schools in UCD actually have a school-wide subscription to some of them. So for instance, in psychology, you have a subscription to Covidence. And I know there are other schools that have it too. So you just have to find out whether your school has a subscription to any of these. If they don't, then Rayan is a free online tool. It's not quite as effective in some ways as COVID and, and Covidence and Distiller SR, but it will still allow you to manage your systematic review in quite a good way. And if you have questions about how to use Rayan, both Dermot and myself can help you with that because we are very familiar with it. And finally, this is a link to an uh, infographic that we have created on the steps that you need to follow to get to the full text of articles. Some of the articles, UCD will have access to it via our subscriptions, and others we may not, but there may be other ways in which we can help you get the full text of the article. So there's the link to the infographic. And finally, there's our systematic review guide, which has a lot of information, guides and manuals, information on how to prepare for a systematic review and how to search, and also how to manage your search results with EndNote. And I'm going